Welcome students to lecture 14 of MHHS 1. Today we're delving deeper into my article, Romantic Disease Discourse, Disability, Immunity, and Literature. We talked last time of the first parts of that title, Romantic Disease Discourse, Di um, Disability, and Immunity. Um, today we'll be, uh, we'll be focusing on more on the disability and literature parts of that title. I know a lot of you will probably have encountered Mary Shelley's most famous novel, Frankenstein, um, published in 1818. Um, if you haven't read it, um, you're still probably aware of its pop cultural significance. Um, it has the distinction of being the most assigned novel in college courses, and I assign it myself in my English 141 course on literature and disability, just because you know it is such a rich and br uh, brilliant novel. Um, and in 2018, I taught a bicentennial celebration course just on the novel's philosophical and literary contexts and its sprawling afterlife. afterlife. Um, but equally rich and brilliant, I think, is Shelley's later novel, The Last Man, published in 1826. And I think it has become especially relevant because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the three volumes of this long novel, high-minded, Utopian revolutions are all gradually unwound by a devastating global plague. What's left are merely brief illness narratives that stir our hearts briefly, only to just fade away by the end. The last gut-wrenching scene of the novel is Lionel Verney, the titular last man of the world, traveling around the globe with his dog in a desperate and futile attempt uh, futile search for any possible survivors of the world-destroying plague. As with Frankenstein, it's an amazingly prescient novel. Um, in Frankenstein, Shelley anticipated quite brilliantly our contemporary bioethical debates about genetic engineering and eugenics. And in The Last Man, she not only predicted the heightened problem of global pandemics, but also in what I think is a stunning feat of prophecy, the eventual eradication of smallpox. In 1826, she predicted smallpox eradication, which would actually happen in real life in 1980, 154 years later. So in this lecture, I'll continue exploring the implications of my essay, especially in terms of disability studies, and afterwards, I'll walk you through some of the details of the arguments and close readings. Last time, I mentioned that this was part of my PhD dissertation at UCLA and ended up being part of my book, The Smallpox Report, Vaccination and the Romantic Illness Narrative, published by the University of Toronto Press in May 2023. So, in the spirit of, as I mentioned last time, thinking of academic articles like this one that you read for today as an open invitation for future thought, work, and research, um, I want to point out that it also led me to think much more about disability studies in terms of both research and teaching. Um, and that work, that extra thinking, ended up being, in, uh, being part of my book, A Brief Literary History of Disability, published in Routledge in July 2022. So before getting into the details of the article itself, I just want to talk a little bit about this book and hopefully get you interested in, um, in taking English 141, um, a course that closely follows the issues brought up in that book, um, and also something that will count in the MHHS uh, program. So amazing and important work is now being done in the field of literary disability studies. Um, and there's a kind of buzz around the topic, it seems. And that excitement is evident here at UCR, as you can tell because you're here in this MHHS introductory course. In my experience, however, um, that excitement remains decidedly rooted in presentism, interest in medical and health humanities in general, and disability studies specifically, tends to cluster around contemporary literature and modern public policy. Um, so my book, um, A Brief Literary History of Disability, instead directs that palpable excitement to a deeper historical archive of literary representations of disability. Now, how we assemble that literary historical archive is, I think, the next big question. So this book, 
um, I'm so, I sort of thought of as a kind of first attempt at that kind of archival assembly. So the book itself has a relatively weird origin stories uh, that actually starts with the article that you read for this week. <clears throat> so when I got my PhD, uh, UCLA was kind enough to let me stay on for a year as a lecturer as I looked for a professor job. So um, they, wanted, uh, they wanted me to teach a literature and disability course that was already on the books, but um, I felt like I wasn't nearly qualified um, enough to teach it at that point. Um, I had just published um, this article on romantic disease discourse that really just mentioned disability studies, but it was really much more about smallpox and about smallpox vaccination. So I gave myself a crash course in disability studies, and it turned out to be a super fascinating topic to me. As I was pivoting from my smallpox book to a second book, I knew I wanted to write on disability studies. Um, so I, um, after that, I was part of the 2019-2020 fellowship cohort at the Huntington Library in San Marino, and I was planning on writing a deeply archival book about Romantic era disability. So I was there trying to answer um, my research question about how to write disability history. How can past experiences and expressions of disabled lives be recovered, um, especially since that record arrives to us frequently distorted, buried, and rewritten to suit normative tastes and politics. Um, so I thought I could answer that question, but what I found at the Huntington, however, um, were frustrating archival silences that I struggled to amplify and to animate. Jane Austen's brother George, for example, had been separated from his seven siblings because of a mental, uh, because of a mental disorder. The sense that I got from the Huntington's wonderfully extensive collection of the Lee family letters, um, and that's the maternal side of Jane Austen's family, was that George, George Austen, was to be neither seen nor talked about because of his mental disorder. And even now, he's still the only Austen sibling, still without a Wikipedia page. And just a side note, if you like Jane Austen, um, I also teach a single author course on her novels. And um, if you're into travel, um, I also offer an eight unit uh, summer study abroad program that features uh, Jane Austen's work. Um, so definitely let me know if you have any questions about that study abroad program. Um, and just UCR offers financial support for these study abroad programs. And I'm a firm believer that world travel is crucial to develop your sense of global citizenship. So just a plug for that. Um, but back to the matter at hand. <clears throat> so when the Huntington Fellows uh, were asked to leave our offices ahead of, our, uh, ahead of schedule because our research, um, before our research questions could be fully answered, um, pandemic necess necessities forced me to write a very different book and reflect more deeply and creatively on my foundational question about how to write disability history. Um, so kicked out of the archives, I was instead looking to um, other things. So instead of looking to historically appropriate documents as I was used to doing, I found unexpected inspiration in modern disability theory, in black feminism, and in queer historiographies. So for example, for Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being, published in 2016, um, writing a history of blackness for her has not meant con conventional archival work, but what she calls wake work, a kind of resistance that riffs creatively and anachronistically on the titular word. Wake for her can mean the perturbed path behind a slave ship along the Middle Passage, a funereal rite to memorialize the casualties in the ship's hold, or a clarifying arrival to consciousness and conscience. So this anachronistic shifting between historical archive and contemporary theory and creative practice has shown up, I think, in the most impactful recent histories of Blackness. And it also shows up in the strategic anachronisms of recent queer historiographies. So what I learned from these authors that uh, was that recovering Black, queer, or disabled histories should not hinge solely on strict adherence to a surviving historical archive that is systemically inflected by violence and erasure. So change, changing gears, right? In, instead of an archival study of romantic era disability, then the pandemic shaped for me 
a more speculative history that paired foundational contemporary disability theory with a large swath of, liter of the literary historical past. So um, in the end, there were at least two uh, answers to my research question about how to write disability history. Um, thinking about archives in the conventional way or going the wake work route and building a more kind of speculative archive. And in the end, the pandemic, um, you know, in a certain sense, made the choice for me. I couldn't do a great job with the conventional archive method since the archives were closed. Uh, so I went the route of acknowledging the inev inevitability of anachronism and creatively and theoretically amplifying that. So in the end, the archival method, I think, is actually not incompatible with Sharp's creatively anachronistic wake work. And I think in the end, writing the history of disabled people will inevitably require both. So if any of this interests you, this is just a preview of uh, what's on offer in English 141, the course um, that I teach in literature and disability. So please sign up for that when it is offered. Okay, that, that was the ad portion of the lecture um, to get you to take um, my English 141 class and maybe think about doing a study abroad with me in London. So think of all the lectures in this introductory course as um, similar encouragements to, uh, to, to, to take classes with all of these brilliant creative and academic minds here at UCR. Um, so, but, but back to the article and to the close reading of The Last Man. So here, um, I just want to focus on one pivotal scene in the novel. Um, it's a very long novel, so I'm just going to narrow it down here. The scene I'm talking about is the scene in which Lionel Verney seems to get his inoculation against the plague, and then he survives to be the titular last man of the novel. Quote, I lowered my lamp and saw a Negro half-clad writhing under the agony of disease while he held me with a convulsive grasp. With mixed horror, and in patience, I strove to disengage myself and fell on the sufferer. He wound his naked festering arms around me. His face was close to mine, and his breath, death-laden, entered my vitals. For a moment, I was overcome. My head was bowed by aching nausea. Till reflection returning, I sprung up, threw the wretch from me, and darting up the staircase, entered the chamber usually inhabited by my family. So this scene, um, if from what we know about the plague, this scene should have infected Lionel Verney with the plague, but it didn't for some reason. Instead, he never developed symptoms besides the momentary, quote, aching nausea and survived to see the year 2100 when the, when the novel concludes. In the essay, um, I mentioned another prominent political theorist of the time, Edmund Burke, who also uses this language of inoculation, but instead of granting medical immunity, he thinks of it only in terms of negative contamination. In the quoted passage from the essay, um, you can hear Burke, a conservative political theorist, uh, cringe at admitting or inoculating anything foreign into the purity of British society. Um, so look at that quote from, from the essay. Um, at the time, uh, the foreignness that he was talking about there was the dangerous ideas of liberty and equality from the French Revolution. In, um, in Shelley's scene, she imagines the shared breath of a white man, Lionel Verney, and a dying black man, not strictly as this kind of Burkean contamination of foreignness, but as a scene of vaccination against the plague. So it is still difficult and far from pure but it isn't the Burkean disaster that Lionel seems to expect. Now, what's interesting about this scene of life-saving vaccination um, is that Lionel acts like it's the grossest thing in the world. Um, so even though Shelley, I think, is very far from Burke's characterization of inoculation, Lionel um, is acting like Burke, refusing to embrace all the forms of otherness that this dying black man seems to embody for Lionel. He experiences, quote, horror, and perhaps more tellingly and more disturbingly, impatience uh, when, when this diseased man comes to seek help. Horrified and impatient, Lionel basically has zero Fs to give for this guy. 
So what, what happens later um, sounds exactly like what happens after you get a vaccination. Um, Lionel says that for a moment he was overcome. He experienced that, quote, aching nausea, and then he got better quickly. Uh, so he has zero time for the dying man, but he, he, he darts quickly upstairs to check on his own family. Um, so in this essay, I argue that the point of the novel is that, um, is that this insular, exclusionary definition of uh, a familial belonging is actually the end of the world. This momentary expansion of a kind of cosmopolitan encounter with otherness is what saves Lionel from the plague, but he doesn't recognize it as a kind of life-saving vaccination. Instead, he calls the dying black man horrifying. He is impatient, and he throws off the, quote, wretch, and he rushes to check on his real family. So when we think about end-of-the-world stories that you know, we're so used to now, there's sometimes this, um, this kind of uh, comforting trope in which the story shows that in the face of species-ending disaster, humanity will come together and unify under a common purpose. And only through this act of unification can we push the world-crushing asteroid out of the way. Um, so this whole novel, um, this really, really long novel, is actually about how this just doesn't happen. And it's clearest, I think, here when Lionel can't even recognize what saved his life at the end. That's the close reading part of the article that I wanted to highlight. Now, the larger argument um, in, the, in, in the essay is how Shelley's novel exemplifies what, um, what I've called a romantic disease discourse, a kind of medico-literary orientation that sounds very different, very far from the way we think about um, professional medicine nowadays. So the first thing to think about is Romantic era medicine's experimentalism. Um, I, I touched on this a little bit last time. I point to things that are clearly uh, laughable nowadays. They, they experimented with nitrous oxide in really, really silly ways. They played with electricity and in maybe even sillier ways. So the point I want to get across, though, is that we focus on these hilarious stories of medical quackery because we like the progress narrative in science, medicine, and technology. Um, in that narrative, we're always boldly moving onward. And from this perspective, um, uh, science, medicine, and technology are unequivocally better than they've ever been. So when we look at these silly people playing with nitrous oxide and electricity, our inclination is to chuckle at them and be thankful for how good we have it now. What I want to remind people who think this way is that smallpox vaccination and all the vaccines that came from smallpox vaccination um, comes from, in turn, this supposedly silly medical literary discourse. So yes, they didn't even know about germs and genes, and they still thought bloodletting was a good idea. Yes, they were backwards in a lot of ways, but they also made vaccination something widely available and desirable. All right, so second, romantic disease discourse refuses to abide by ironclad categories or classifications. So um, we talked actually a lot about this last time. Um, only now has medicine, for example, um, begun to accept autism as not a category identified by a fixed checklist, but a spectrum of behaviors. That's just an example. Um, in the early 19th century, everything seemed to be on a kind of spectrum, and there wasn't yet an overwhelming need to just concretely pin things down into, a path into pathology and cure. Thirdly, uh, romantic disease discourse allows for multiple perspectives to inform the development of treatment and care. Um, individual patient narratives actually seem to matter in a way that they do not matter now. So there wasn't yet this professional class of physicians, um, although that kind of professionalization was happening at the time, um, there wasn't this kind of technical monopoly on medical knowledge. So what patients reported and narrated about their own bodies factored in significantly to the conceptions of health and of disease. So Lionel's failure to recognize the dying man in front of him is a failure, I argue, on all three counts, um, on all three aspects of what I've called romantic disease discourse. 
He refuses to accept the experimentally weird in encountering this new world-destroying plague. He refuses to categorize the infection as anything other than death-laden vitals. Um, and even when nothing has worked um, in the whole novel, he seeks only a certain kind of familiar medical knowledge for his assessment of the situation. So in the end, I argue that recent efforts in narrative medicine, in disability studies, and in medical and health humanities, I think would do well to actually go back and learn from Shelley's 200-year-old prophecy. In contemporary medicine's relentless drive to seek diagnostic efficiencies and one-to-one -one correspondences between disease and cure, um, what I'm arguing here is that we've lost this romantic disease discourse that um, is a way for us to think about historically how to inclusively value illness narratives um, from everyone and advocate for care before immediately pathologizing.